Today I'm going to show you the newly redesigned Acura MDX. Why waste your money on a Mercedes-Benz SUV when you get just about everything that's on them in a Japanese car that doesn't break down and cost about one third of what the Mercedes costs. Now if you watch my video on the Mercedes SUV, how the guy hated it and he paid $150,000, $60,000 for the thing and it kept recalling it and the mirror whistled. Well, the only similarity between this and a Mercedes is they're both built in the United States. Granted the Mercedes, it was made in Alabama, didn't have such great quality control. This one's made by Honda Motor Company, they own Acura, and they are insanely built. Realize, Honda and Acura have built millions and millions of cars in Ohio and in other parts of the United States. They know what they're doing. I, of course, like the Japanese made ones, but really, you know, the engine comes from Japan, the transmission, all that stuff. But what makes this an interesting car is if you know anything about cars, for a while, people weren't buying these. They saw them as too old stogie. They were buying a Lexus with all the fancy stuff. Nothing wrong with a Lexus, but they decided they're going to compete. And they've made a really interesting vehicle, as you're going to see. Now, with prices as insane as they are, the guy paid around $60,000 for the car. But what a car you get for $60,000. Now, this thing has the Honda Vectoring all-wheel drive system. You'll see when you drive it. It handles ice, snow, you name it. It's made for driving. Now, the first thing you'll notice is it's an SUV, but it's relatively low to the ground. They deliberately made it that way. So when you add an all-wheel drive system with a torque factoring, and the fact that it's lower, this thing handles infinitely better than, say, the Lexus SUVs. I've tried them both. This is much better. This is an actual three-row car. The problem with some of the Lexus is they got three rows, and there's no room in the back, and their head's kind of stuck behind a pillar. This is completely different. Watch this. You don't even have to grab it with your hand. Check it out. It opens itself up to get to the third row of seats. And as you can see, there's a reasonable amount of space in there. Plus, if you're one of those fanatics about moon roofs, which I think are kind of stupid, but people like them, you can have big moon roofs. So if you want to open it up and scream and yell at people in YouTube videos, feel free. I like it because it has actual chrome. Now, when we open it up, this is a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. This one's dirty now, but that's because they've got this down. Well, if you want to be clean, you just flip it upside down and then... It's dirty. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's dirtier on that side, but... When you vacuum it all, it's all clean inside. You got them all kinds of space when you put them down. Oh. <laughs> you got to move that seat up a little further to get down, but you get the idea. You can carry a lot of stuff on one of these. You move those seats down, you can bring a baby elephant if you want. Now, the one downside of this car is what's under the hood. It's luxury, so there's no proper. There's hydraulics. And it's an excellent engine, but it's got one problem. Now, it's a very reliable, very powerful engine. But at the same time, it's a pretty big vehicle, even though it's lowered. You don't buy one of these to get gas mods. Don't even think about it. His mother gets 17 miles a gallon. He got 13 driving over here in sport mode. So don't expect a gas mods on this thing. That's not what it's about. Oh, look, the full carbon fiber. Well, what do people use carbon fiber for? Weighs less, right? Well, the weight reduction obviously didn't work out too well if he's getting 13 miles a gallon in that thing. And I gotta say, Honda's still living in the past. 2022. Look at it, it's still got a timing belt, a rubber timing belt. Man, I'm never going to wise up and put timing chains on these things. I truthfully think Honda will not on their V6s. Because like everybody else, they're all going into electric cars, and hybrid electric cars. Take my son's year old Toyota Sienna hybrid. It doesn't have the Toyota Sienna V6 engine. It's got the four cylinder engine with the hybrid. And they'll probably end up doing the same thing. They won't have a V6 hybrid. They would make a four cylinder. And the Honda four cylinder engines, they've had timing chains for ages in them too. They just, I guess, don't want to go through the R&D and change everything just for a belt versus a chain. And who knows, maybe they have this Asian idea that we'll make a lot of money changing the timing belts. Or if they break, then the engines will go. And we'll sell them an expensive engine. Or even better, we'll sell them another car. But be that as it may, they run fine. 
you just got to change it every 100,000 miles. And when you get the bill for that, you kind of wonder why they didn't put a chain in in the first place. After all, it is a $60,000 car. Now, here's a really interesting thing. It has a 10-speed marvelous transmission that Honda makes, and they tout it as having all kinds of power and efficiency. But I got to disagree on the efficiency. I mean, if he's getting 13 miles a gallon, his mother, very conservative, is getting 17. It's not all that efficient because, if you remember a couple years ago, I was in one of those giant Ford Expeditions, and it had a 10-speed Ford transmission in it, the one that GM and Ford made together and then they split apart like cats and dogs fighting, right? But I got like 27 miles a gallon in that thing and that was a huge expedition. So I gotta say, the power, yes, gas mileage, no. Now if you notice, it's got a classic nice smooth hood. They don't wanna have any bumps sticking out. So check this out. The air intake is built on the bottom side, comes through here and then goes into the engine this way. It's pretty interesting. You can see there is a tremendous amount of working room on this thing. But then again, it's a Honda. You may never have to work on this thing. But still, much to my happiness, the beauty cover is pretty small. You know, you get to see the engine. This I don't mind at all. Because, of course, you got all kinds of stuff inside here for sucking the air in and filtering stuff. And I don't mind that at all. It's not covering up the nice part of the engine that you can see. Let's look inside. It's just like that Bronco. It's got all kinds of pictures and sounds. It's got the wireless charging pan. Oh, look, we're like a fire jet here. Fire one, fire two. <laughs> it also has a brake hold, which is pretty handy. Automatic start stop there. And yes, you can turn it off. I advise turning it off. If an engine keeps turning itself on and off, 90-something percent of your wear occurs on startup, so you keep wearing your engine out. Not a good idea to use it. And hey, his mother doesn't turn it off and it still only gets 17 miles a gallon with a conservative driver. So really, so much for the automatic start-stop. I think it's a bunch of crap. But hand-stitched leather, this, to me, is a much higher quality car than the Mercedes that costs three times as much. Look, it's got the 360, there's the Matrix. You can get different views. I mean, this thing is really tricked out. And I like the Mercedes, not as broken yet. Now we have air conditioned, heated seats, both sides. If you want to pay a little extra, you get the massaging seat. I find it kind of weird. I tried one when I was driving, and it really kind of distracts you from the road. So I don't advise buying that feature unless you want to park and use it. It's kind of weird while you're driving. And of course, you got all these dynamic modes. You put it in snow. It's in the snow, comfort, normal. And of course, he drives all the time in sport. Then you can customize it for yourself if you want. It's got lane control, automatic cruise control, watches in front of you. It's, it's a pretty much technological marvel. But let's see how it goes. I wonder what this donut flying in the air is. That's the speedometer. It's got a heads up panel too. So you don't have to look off the road to see how fast you're going. And watch when you put it in reverse, look the mirrors do. They tilt down so you see behind better. And if you or perhaps your wife has a tendency of hitting curbs, well, it's kind of hard to get a curb when you got a picture of the tire and you can see exactly where you're sitting. They have no one to blame but yourself for hitting the curb. <laughs> well, I didn't see it. Let's see how this thing goes. It really goes. Makes a nice sound too. And this is a normally aspirated engine. This isn't a turbo. I can see why they think it's 13 miles a gallon though. Quite an impressive ride, I must say. Aside from the bad gas mileage, hey, it's everything anybody's gonna want in a vehicle like this. For what it is, if you don't mind the bad gas mileage, it's certainly an excellent vehicle. He bought it for his mother, she wanted something luxurious, and now of course she's spoiled, but then again, with the mileage they're driving, this thing might outlast her, who knows? I mean, I've seen older ones with 250 on them and they're still going okay. If you're looking for actual luxury that holds up i would say goodbye to mercedes-benz you could buy three of these for the price of one mercedes and then you definitely would never have to buy another car the rest of your life because that would last for who knows a million miles or more <laughs> the guy bought it for two thousand dollars and it had twenty thousand miles less when he bought it here's the truth about these things and of course the truth about this is he actually bought it from a relative who was going to sell it for five but he gave it to him for two so he practically got it for nothing now he's the fourth owner but originally it came from texas so probably not going to have too much rust on it and yes it is the four-wheel drive you can turn it on you can turn it off you got low 
you got high, and then a regular automatic transmission. Now you got lucky come from New York City to here because you got 20 and a half miles a gallon. That's the best you're ever going to get with one of these. But when he's in the city, he's pouring a lot of gas in because he gets about 13 once he only got 12. It's a big vehicle. Going to use gas. It's just the way that it is. Yeah, big tire. High clearance. I'm kind of amazed that it gets 20 and a half miles a gallon on a highway. So why do people buy them? Well, two reasons. They made in Japan, and two, they can basically last four ever with very little maintenance that's the big thing behind these they're built on an actual truck frame they got a solid toyota v6 engine now in the 20 000 miles he's driven it the only major thing was he replaced the radiator well it was the original radiator and they are plastic and aluminum you gotta expect that he changed the oil he put new tires you gotta expect to put tires when you buy a vehicle that's normal wear and tear he changed the oil filter no big maintenance that's how these things can run. You don't have to put a lot of money in them. Even if they got a couple hundred thousand miles on them. No, it's all glad the timing belt changed, because yes, it is a rubber timing belt. They tell you to change them every 100,000 miles, but it is not an interference engine. So if you're a gambling man like to roll the dice, if it breaks, it stops running, you tow it to a guy like me, we put a new one and away you go. It doesn't damage anything. And if you really want the truth of it, you know how many timing belts I've seen break on these? None. I've never seen one ever break. I had a guy with 250,000 and he never changed the belt. It was still working. Now this was a Texas car. You can see after a while the bumper starts to corrode, gets a crack, you could re-chrome it. You have to take this ding out too, but that isn't the car's fault. But let's look down at the frame. Now it's a 97, I can tell it was a Texas car, because look, it's frame solid, not rotten. You're always going to get little parts that got surface rust. If you're a fanatic, you could sand it all down, get a wire brush, brush it off, undercoat it, paint it with primer. But, look at this thing. You find one like this, snap it up. Is the northern ones back in 97, they, they got quite a bit of rust on them. While we're down here, We'll see. Here's the transfer case. We had the transfer case to run the front, and the back runs on the regular drive shaft off the transmission. It is an actual four-wheel drive vehicle, like a real truck. But while we're under here, you'll notice you don't see oil leaking anywhere. These things are well made. You can still see the original gasket still in there. It's not leaking at all. I realize the forerunners, the early ones, if you take a look at one, hey, they were just a pickup truck that had two doors put on the back and they got rid of the bed with four-wheel drive that you can turn on and off and compare it to the modern ones you know they're basically gigantic SUVs now and the big thing people have against these are they say they ride like trucks well of course they do because they're trucks now modern ones ride better because they've got all that computer technology they've been added to it yeah as time goes on you can make them ride better but I'll tell you the truth there's nothing that's going to last one like this. These things just keep going and going. And he's added LED lights on it. You can add whatever you want. He's planning on raising it a few inches more, which if he wants to do a little lift isn't going to hurt anything. I'm not a big fan of lifts, but, you know, let's face it. If he lives in New York City, how fast is he going to be driving? 10, 15 miles an hour? As we look inside, yeah, it's got seat cover. Of course, over the years, those seats are going to crack. That's just what happens when you got leather seats. That's why I like fabric ones. Here's the original back ones. You can see it cracks and stuff, but it's not ripped. It's still in pretty good shape. There is leg room in these things. There's lots of leg room. And look, even though it's old, it's got a sunroof. And as we look inside the trunk, look at the space. You can carry all kinds of things. You flip that down. You can carry a million things in one of these. Decent towing capability too. Still got a spare tire. Usually people have lost them by now, but you can see he's been living in New York City, so the rear end, the differential is rusted, but it's just superficial rust. If you wanted, you could clean it all off and then prime it and paint it and coat it. Again, we can see the frame solid. This here, that's superficial rust anyways. That's the tow hitch. Toyota didn't make that. This is an added on tow hitch. And although it wasn't painted that well, that steel is still going to last for a thousand years with that little bit of rust on this thick steel. You can paint it if you're a fanatic, but I mean, really. Oh, so we can scan to a lot, hook it up. Make sure it knows what it is. Let's do a diagnosis. We'll do a smart scan. Realize in an old car like this, you're going to get a limited amount of data. It's not like the new ones where I have 50 lines. No, there's just a few on these. As old as it is, there's no codes, there's no anomalies. You gotta expect that in these toilets. It's just so well made. What I like is a lot of it's still mechanical. Here's your four wheel drive. You shift it in manually. It's not some computer. It's not electronics. It's a physical connection that generally can last forever. Check it out. You can change the shifting. The electronically controlled transmission itself 
You can put it into power so it'll shift later and have more zoom if you're going up a hill or towing something. Let's check the back window out. Hey, look, it's a Toyota. It still works. It doesn't care how old it is. Try that on a GM or Chrysler product that's this age. It'd probably rust and fall off if it even worked. Now, for all its mileage and its age, the engine sounds good. Now, you'll see. It is in New York City now, so you're seeing a lot of the stuff starting to get corrosion. But it still runs perfectly fine. Yes, believe it or not, the AC still works. The nip and dentos that they use on these Toyotas are quite well made. Of course, it's running fine. You put it in gear. It's not shaking. Of course, it doesn't have a backup camera on it. And he added the Pioneer stereo, you know? We're talking about old times. But interestingly enough, he put a Pioneer stereo in, but he left the controls for the original radio that Toyota put in. Here we go into Rhode Island roads. And even though they're bumpy, hey, and as old as this thing is, it takes the bumps pretty good. It rode a lot better than that Tesla I tried out the other day. And this is a big old truck. We'll see what the six cylinder engine can do. Step on the gas. And it makes a lot of noise. And it does accelerate. Nothing outrageously fast, but it's a big heavy vehicle. We're being passed by a Volkswagen. Shame of shame. But it shifts fine. It goes down the road. It's not a racing truck. It never was meant to be a racing truck. It'll get you where you're going. Very dependable. It's not going to strand you somewhere. And for a big heavy truck, hey, it's like anything big and heavy. You kind of sail it like a boat, but it goes where you point it. And you can see the steering wheel stable, all this mileage. Front end's still in good shape. Yeah, you're going to hear noises rattling when you're going over bumps. But hey, it's a truck. You live with stuff like that. You know, the new ones are a lot quieter. Yeah, but as good as this thing runs, it is a steal. So you wonder, why do people pay high dollar for these things? Even if they have two, three hundred thousand miles? Now you know, because they can last forever. Now, you take a look underneath. This thing spent most of its life in Texas. No rust. It was a steal to buy this vehicle at any price. The only problem that you can often have on these is, let's say it spent its life in Massachusetts, in Michigan, Minnesota. You'll often see they'll be rotting away underneath and you don't want to buy them then. You'd have to do a frame off restoration it would cost a fortune. But if you can find one of these that have spent most of its life in Texas and you want one, snap it up because price the new ones. They're insanely expensive. Even if you bought one of these that had a blown engine, you could put an engine in. There's tons of engines around for these things. You can get remanufactured engines. If the frame and body's in good shape, my advice is snap it up if you're looking for a vehicle like this. Here's a Honda Pilot. It's an 09. I'm going to tell you the absolute truth about them what goes wrong with them, what's wrong with this one, what doesn't go wrong with them, whether you should buy one or not. Now these are all put together in the United States. This particular one, he's wondering about the transmission. He's the original owner, getting a little herky-jerky. We're gonna road test it with my computer and check it out. But when it comes to buying these things, Sad but true for this owner, the one year you don't want to buy is 2009, because that's the one that's notorious for having transmission problems. Now, if you're thinking about buying one today, and it's an older one like this, especially 2009, first take it for a road test before you do anything. Take it on the highway, take it in the city. If it starts lurching at gears, shuddering, bring it back and say, no thanks, I don't want to buy it because it's going to need a transmission. A lot of the other ones have more minor problems that are obvious to see. The later model ones had paint that bubbled up. You can see this paint's still in perfectly good shape and it's black. And if anything's going to fade, it's going to be black paint from the heat of the sun. You can see there's some rust because this is Massachusetts. You can see the bolts are really rusting, but that's not the car's fault. That's just cheap bolts. The vehicle itself, as we go under, it's still really solid. That's not a problem that these have. They're pretty solid built. I mean, look at it. There's a lot of aluminum, which of course, aluminum doesn't rust. You got a steel control arm. Believe me, it's going to rust. I've even seen lots of steel control arms rust off. This one's aluminum, better design. Costs more to make, but in the long run, it's a better deal. And some of them, the brakes wear out and the rotors warp, but they don't cost that much money to replace brake pads and rotors. It's not that big of a deal. Now, this one came with leather seats. They're still in decent shape. And being a 2009, it's got a reasonable amount of stuff on it here. It didn't come with a backup camera. Or I should say, it doesn't have the normal backup camera that you're going to see in the dash. That came later. It's got one built into the rear view mirror. Now it's somewhat smaller, you can see. If you get old like me, it's going to be harder to see, but it's still there. It was a pretty luxurious vehicle in its day. It's got the old... <laughs> 
<laughs> player here for DVDs for the kids. And being four wheel drive, using the button, setting what you want. One of the big reasons people buy these is because they are large SUVs. It's the largest one that Honda makes. There's a lot of space here. Put the seats down, there's even more space. And as we go in the trunk, big gigantic trunk, there's more seats if you want more seats. These things have a lot of room and the people in the back not only have some space, they got a decent view. It's not like they're inside a cave like some of these are. So we'll go into the hood and see that it has a great engine. It's a Honda V6. It does have rubber timing belts, which he recently had changed. That's one thing you had to do, it's an interference engine. But it gets around 20 miles a gallon on a highway and for something this big and this heavy, that's about as good as it's ever going to get if you have a gasoline engine. You'd have to go to a smaller engine and a hybrid setup. If you went to a four-cylinder engine and hybrid, my son's four-cylinder Sienna gets 37 miles a gallon. But it's not a four-cylinder, not a six, and it's also got the hybrid boost. So unless you get into high technology, this is about the best you're going to get, especially in this year. It still runs perfectly fine, the engine and everything, but he's worried about the transmission. We're going to take it for a road test in a few minutes to see exactly what's going on there. Now, of course, the transmission is a real big deal, but he still got the original AC compressor. He recently had the alternator changed, and he changed one of the ignition coils. Not that big of a deal for all these years. But realize one thing on this particular Honda. 14 years old, but check it out. It's only got 127,000 miles on it. So in my book, or most people, that's low mileage for all these years. Normally, that's nothing on a Honda, but the problem here is this is the one year <laughs> that they had problems with the automatic transmissions and these things. I mean, you can get a problem in any particular car, but it was more or less a design flaw of this particular model. So we're plugging the out scan tool on with the engine not running to get the interface set up. While we're waiting, you can see there's all kinds of space. This thing was well designed. Got a big old storage unit here. Even though it's an older car, it's got all kinds of power outlets on it. Realize that the Pilot shares a lot of stuff with the Acura MDX. A lot of stuff's very similar on them, so they're pretty luxurious vehicles. There's nothing slouchy about it. A complex car. We need a complex scanner to really get serious about it. We'll do all systems. You can see we're going through an awful lot of stuff here, which is a big reason. If you're going to buy a used car like this, you want a guy like me to check it out. There's too much things that could possibly go wrong. Going through 47 separate systems here. 7 out of 47, 8 out of 47. Now while we're waiting, realize originally these pilots were made in Canada, but they've been made in Alabama for quite some time. But sadly, in the case of this 2009, it shared a lot of stuff with the Honda Odyssey van. And guess what? Those Honda Odyssey vans of the same year they had automatic transmission problems. Same engine too, so it's no surprise that both of these in 2009 had automatic transmission problems. And if the owners don't change the oil enough, a lot of these will burn a little bit of oil as they age, especially the ones that have those variable engines that turn off cylinders, sometimes, sometimes not. Those, a lot of those are oil burners. If you do have one of those, my advice is to pay a guy like me to turn off the system that shuts the cylinders off every once in a while so that it only runs on four instead of six to get better gas mileage. That makes them burn oil too. So I wouldn't keep one of those systems active if you bought one with that system. I would have it disconnected. A lot of times up we got the codes. There's four of them. So let's check them out. We'll look at the BCM, circulation control motor. We really don't care about that. Now the other codes are ABS and tire pressure monitoring system. As with most older cars, the tire pressure monitoring systems aren't going to work anymore. The batteries go dead in the wheels. It costs the fortune to fix most people don't care they'll get a tire pressure gauge they won't spend a bunch of money fixing that crap and the abs and airlock brake system has one code which is ecm pcm relation failure ah, the computers aren't talking to each other right so he's worried about the tranny so what we're going to do is we're going to go to transmission data say any codes there's no trouble codes so we're going to look at the live data and as you can see we have 62 bits of live data and we're going to record it and take it on a road test we go on a road test nice big high vehicle a few creeks here and there you're going to get that on an older vehicle especially one that lives in the ross land of massachusetts we'll see how the tranny shifts i felt a little jiggle there let's see how passing gear works not bad see how it shifts here 
really too bad so far. I can feel a slight jiggle when it's going down. Nothing outrageous. I'm standing, starting and see how it feels. Yes, there's a little jiggle there in the first, the second, and the second, the third. Nothing outrageous. Let's go back and analyze the data. So here we go to the data playback and you can watch. There's a lot of frames, 4,143 frames. So I play them and I start analyzing the data. And I can see that first to second and second to third especially, there's a little lag in the command of the shift and the actual shifting of the gear. It's not tripping any code, so it's not bad yet, but it's worn somewhat. So, it does have that little shifting jiggle, but a lot of them will do it as they age. Now, this is a notorious problematic transmission, just like the ones they had in the Honda Odyssey, which shares a lot of similar parts, right? But, since he's only got 127,000 miles, I predict this thing will still go for quite some time. It'll just have selected little jittery shifting, up shifts or down shifts, because they're somewhere. Now, on the other hand, I would not buy one of these used if it had 200 something thousand miles on it, but since he's the original owner and it's got that jiggle in it, but it's really not bad and it hasn't tripped any codes, things aren't as bad as the owner might think. The codes only trip when they get to 20 something percent plus or minus. It's nowhere near that. So, if he babies it, it still might go quite some time. The money to replace the transmission on one of these four-wheel drive jobs. In the past, I had customers in Houston get them fixed free when they were still under warranty. And it was a fortune if they had to pay out of their pocket. Some of it was eight, ten thousand dollars $10,000. That was back then, so you know it's going to be even more today. But this one is not bad yet. Now, let's say you were going to buy this vehicle with 127,000 miles on it. I wouldn't pay that much for it just because you know, eventually the transmission's gonna go out. There's no saying. I mean, it took him 13, 14 years. He put that little bit of mileage on it. It might still last him quite some time. Of course, the good news for other people is if you get a really later model one, they don't particularly have transmission problems with them. They iron the problems out. Now, they're expensive vehicles. There's no doubt in that, but they're big. They're Honda. They can last a long time. And the only real negative of all of them are, for some bizarre reason, even the new ones use rubber timing belts. But they're good engines. You just gotta make sure you change that belt every 100,000 miles. You don't wanna ruin an engine because a stupid little $50 belt decided it was gonna snap. That's the only downfall of this particular design. So if you never wanna miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.